Major funding for these programs is provided by grants from HSH Nordbank and First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, Allied Partners, Bank of America, Murray Hill Properties, SJP Properties, Greenberg Trorig LLP. Additional funding is provided by grants from Antares Investment Partners, Arbor Realty Trust, Athena Group, BRT Realty Trust, Burden LLP, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Habitats, City Investment Fund, Cushman and Wakefield, Eastern Consolidated, Essex Capital Partners, Helmsley Spear, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Jackson Development Group, Meridian Capital Group, McSam Hotel Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Moynian Organization, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sydney Fetner Associates, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, Sutfin Properties, The Wickhoff Organization, Extreme Construction and Deconstruction. Hello, my name is Michael Stoll, host of the Stoller Report, Real Estate Trends in the Tri-State Region. The Bronx, the home of the Yankees, the home of major development. But 30 years ago, Tom Wolfe wrote a book called Bonfires of the Vanities. And when Ed Koch and other people went to the Bronx, all they saw was burnt out shells. They saw all this destitute area. But today, I'm bringing together three individuals who are really involved with the redevelopment of the Bronx. My guests include Mark Altheim, who is a principal at Atlantic Development Group and co-founder, Numa Jerome, Senior Vice President and Director of Leasing for Arcadia Realty Trust, and last but definitely not least, Neil Weissman, uh, CEO Chairman of Jackson Development Group. Neil, you, you, I mean, you're older than, I'm a little older than you, happy birthday, but Thank you. Uh, when you finished Brooklyn Law School, your first job was in the Bronx. I was assistant district attorney for three years. I got out of law school, um, graduated in June, uh, took the bar, and uh, August 15th, I was at the criminal court on 161st Street uh, practicing law. We were allowed to do that in those days. So let's, but you know what? I'd like to really say, what was the Bronx like, what was it, 37 years ago? Yeah, the Bronx was uh, basically what you've discussed. Um, it was a wonderful experience. Unfortunately, crime was rampant in the Bronx at the time, on 161st Street, they would call it Fort Apache at the time. We used to have, I myself was handling 60 to 70 cases a day, and I had just gotten out of law school. They allowed the assistant DAs who were hired and legal aid at that time to practice before being admitted to the bar. And um, it's certainly not the Bronx of today. So it was the Wild West? I don't want to classify it as the Wild West, but it was, it was a lot of crime, a lot of crime in the Bronx. Now, Mark, when you started developing at Atlantic Development Group in the Bronx, it was what, 1998? 1998. So it's, you know, it's eight years, it's 10 years ago. What was the Bronx like 10 years ago? I think uh, under the stewardship of Frey Ferrer that you started to sense that it was time that the Bronx should be developed and there was a lot of opportunities. Uh, albeit the cost of land at that point in time, uh, at that time the city, city of New York held auctions for land and we would go to these auctions and the first piece that my partner Peter Fine and I bought was for $35,000 for a 60,000 square foot building uh, from the city of New York on Hughes Avenue. Uh, but the nice price per square foot. That was a good price per square foot. So. Now you're paying that per unit, practically. So um, we felt it was ripe and that there was, um, New York was starting to come back and the Bronx, because it was, had a lot of vacant land, you felt that it was, it was time. So let's really talk about what's happening in the Bronx today. I mean, you have a major, pr pr a village, a college. Tell me, tell my, uh, my audience, because I'm gonna screw up the name, Borica? Borica. I knew it, that's Barriqua why. Borica College. Barriqua College. another word for Puerto Rico. 
And tell me and what, what is this a, is, because Neil has a development right nearby also. Well, ironically, when Neil used to work at the old criminal courthouse, it was just demolished as of yesterday, and we found his old resume in, in, the, uh, in the desk of one of the, uh, the basements. So it is kind of ironic, a good juxtaposition of stuff going on here. So uh, we're building Bariqua Village, which is the brainchild of my partner, Peter Fine, along with Dr. Victor Alessia, who heads the Bariqua College. And we created a community called Bariqua Village, which um, is really also a product of the political uh, wherewithal uh, of the members in the Bronx, the Bronx City Council, the Bronx Borough President, the elected officials of the Bronx. We worked together to formulate a plan, along with city planning, to come up with a village, which is what Atlantic Development Group is about right now. We're trying to create mixed-use communities that help bring up community. So it's so, not all so about so affordable housing. tell me about housing. this village. It's about 900 and over 900,000 square feet. It includes a college building that's going to be 13 stories high, 120,000 square feet, and it contains uh, si si seven separate apartment buildings. And half of them are for people making over $40,000 a year. The other half are for people making between households between 25 and 40. So it's, it's really emblematic of what needs to happen in the Bronx. Now, how much is the maximum you can make to be in that in the apartments. I think it's like 165% of the area median income. That's correct. And the area median income, I think, is 72,400, something like that. So somebody it's about 110,000. So $110,000, somebody could have an apartment in a brand new building in a village. How far is this from sub? Right it's in a suburb? great section. It's on 161st Street, right off of Third Avenue. Um, right, when Neil is doing 600 apartments not far from where we are. So. Uh, the, the and you're going to have uh, parkland, and you're also going to have retail, about 40,000 square it feet. It really is a village. You have um, parking for 200 cars. You have apartment houses for low-income people. You have apartment houses for affordable housing. You have co-op, a co-op where people can purchase. You have a college, and you have a lot of open space. It was a five-acre site, so there's a lot of open space, and really is, uh, I think, a prototype of what you can do in the Bronx if you have five acres of land. Uh, and what are you doing very nearby? Uh, we're building um, just a few blocks away from Barrico, which is currently being demolished for the new construction. Uh, we're building 600 apartments in eight buildings. Um, city planning and the uh, um, people don't want to see 20-story buildings anymore. You know, the, they really don't want to go over 10, 12, 14 stories. And we have similar to uh, Mark in Atlantic. We have uh, one building of seniors. Uh, a few of the buildings are affordable. Uh, we have mid-income, and we also have 160 units of uh, what we call market-rate affordable condominiums, which have a price point of about $285,000. And now, the interesting thing, which I always, you know, people always talk about this, all these apartments are available via a lottery, correct? Um, In well, Europe, when every one of your apartments is a lottery. Every one of the apartments that we have, because the city of New York, no, no, I'm, I know, but I'm talking is a lottery. In, in, it's subject to a lottery, which means that someone has to. Uh, there's an advertisement on online on HPD's website. If people want to find out about all the apartments that Neil and everybody does, you can find out and you apply, and you have to. Fill and you an can eat, and you, uh, and you know, from my viewers, you can you can find out about the newest developments if you apply. Uh, email alerts. I get them every time they have a new deal. And it, it tells you which development is coming up. It shows the PDF of the flyer, and it tells you how to apply for the lottery. That's correct. Now, in your units? In our units, is the same thing as Mark, uh, except the condominiums, uh, if you want to get subsidies, you don't have to, but if you want to get subsidies to bring it out to a broader group with a, low, with a lower AMI, uh, then you have to uh, apply through a lottery. But if they're just going to be market rate, affordable market rate, you can sell them to anybody doesn't make a difference. But we find that most of the condos, and we expect the condos at uh, 156th to 159th Street, will be uh, uh, lotteries, those people who qualify for subsidies uh, from AHC, which is a subsidy up to $32,000 an apartment. Uh, you also are eligible for a subsidy through HPD, which is about $10,000 if you take a special course for first-time home buyers. And then, depending on the bank that they finance through, um, you can get uh, up to $10,000 in uh, bank subsidies. So here, I'm, I'm listening, you're having 600 units? We're having a total of 600. What I failed to mention is we have 45,000 square foot of retail. 
which is also vital, which is the linchpin. Right, but uh, but I want I, I want to get into Numa, who's who who's here also. So you have six hundred units, you have four hundred units. He has seven hundred fifty. We have six hundred. 50,000 commercial, Mark has 40,000 commercial, hundreds of parking spaces, and that's why we need Arcadia Trust to bring the commercial. And in. what are you doing? I mean, besides being the good looking guy over here, <laughs> what, what are you doing here? Uh, I mean, you buy a property on Fordham Road, the former Sears building, in the busiest Fordham and Webster Avenue, as we were saying, and then you buy another property on 161st Street? Tell me, what, what are you doing? You trying to serve the underserved needs of the community? Uh, yes, I, I think. The key point to remember is the underserved piece where we have a third, uh, th there's a th two thirds less retail per capita in New York than there is in the rest of the country. So uh, barriers of, of entry um, are very high and the density and the uh, disposable income is, is certainly there. So, you know, for us it's a no brainer and this is, this is comparable to what we're doing in Brooklyn. There's a renaissance, a renaissance happening in the boroughs and this is certainly part of that. Uh, and I, what we've done is really try to serve the community in terms of bringing in the right type of retail, uh, the Best Buy, the Walgreen, eventually a bank there, uh, and also a fitness place, 24-hour fitness. And that's what you're going to be doing at the Fordham Road. Site. Fordham Road, correct. But Fordham Road has always been, I mean, f even the years when you first started the DA, right. was a major shopping. Number one in the Bronx. It was number one in the Bronx. Right. It sounds Probably. like he's getting a different quality. Of tenant that that is that is a, really a boon to the community. I mean, is there a Best Buy on Fordham Road? I mean, is there a Circuit City on Fordham Road? There's not a Circuit City on Fordham Road. Are there it's any a lot electronics? I, I, I know Some at one time pops. there used to right. be a Crazy Eddie or uh, a Whiz going back before right. they went bankrupt. Uh, right. But uh, these people are going to Fordham Road now. What type of tenancy are you going to have on your property on 161st Street? which well, you bought a couple of years ago. It's, it's convenience and it's service, but it's also with an eye on the courthouse because there'll certainly be uh, plenty of traffic, um, plenty of daytime population. So I, I, I don't want to make a joke, but if, yes. if you're saying it's near the courthouse, and since you were a DA, are you going to have a do you rent a store to a bail bondsman or do you rent the store to a check cashing space? I mean, th to meet, I hate to say, to meet the, the service of the community. They're well, there now. Yeah, I think we try to merchandise to the highest level tenancy possible, um, and I I try not to bring my own personal judgments and opinions in terms of what's the right level of retail, what's the type right type of retail. But there is a judgment uh, component to this, and whether or not a check cashing brings you enough of the kind of traffic that you're looking for versus a food user or a different type of service that caters more but, to the but, community. But you know, we were talking prior to the show, and Mark was talking, the, the, you know, the biggest problem that we said in Harlem that happened, they didn't have a supermarket in the path, Mark. Um, in the Bronx, you really don't, with the exception of near Co-op City or certain the other sections, you really don't have the supermarket, you have the bodegas. Right. Uh, but you were talking about fanfare. It's uh, a fine fare. Fine which fare. Is a, which is in a high, you know, pretty high-level supermarket. But you were saying they're having difficulties uh, to, to do well in their stores. I think that um, Fine Fair has a, a great product and it's sorely needed. As to what their success rate is right now, I'm not exactly sure. No, but w w for example, you, you're making a village. You have other places. Would a Fine Fair go there or, or would a Fine Fair, I mean, be, is there a supermarket on Fordham Road? On Fordham Road, I uh, doubt it. There is not. No, I they think don't. you've got some small Supermarkets operators. Supermarkets notoriously yeah. don't pay higher rents. That's part of the problem. Exactly right. Because right. you make a decision in terms of how you merchandise, and some of it's based on ultimately but achieving in, the but right mix. But in certain areas, you know, uh, in, a, in Lower Manhattan, for example, and what uh, Douglas Durst did at the, the Helena on 57th Street, he said. I have residents and I have to provide a need and in the same way that you said to me before with regard to the type of tenancy, sometimes you, the landlord, has to make a decision of saying, hey, I'll provide something for the community and maybe I'll get that small grocer or I'll get that amenities and that's what they had to do in Lower Manhattan. Yeah, I think that it's always a struggle to weigh what type of tenancy versus what serves the needs of the community. Certainly. Atlantic Development Group has an ear to what the folks in, in our communities are looking for. However, as Neil and I were discussing, is to attract that quality tenant to the Bronx is, is somewhat challenging. Walgreens right. is a great example. Walgreens is almost a supermarket, right? They have everything but That's right. you know, produce uh, in, their, super, in their, their aisles. So are they going to be 24-7? 
Yes, they are going to be 24 hour. So for us, the challenge is if you have storefront, you have 10,000 square feet uh, to balance the needs of the community with what the uh, available tenancy is, and it, but, it, but it you, is challenging. But, but you know, let's look at the at the college. You know, a college has a different need. Uh, I mean, you know, you have a bookstore perhaps as as a need of a college. Uh, when you and a lot of the the, the students who go there work part time uh, or part time students, so you may have to have you know some type of restaurants or you know maybe a different type of you know uh, packaged food places. You know, on that situation, uh, do you see? Um, Starbucks or Dunkin Donuts opening in your type of uh, center? Uh, definitely uh, uh, Dunkin Donuts and possibly a Starbucks. Between the two projects that Mark and I were talking about, you have um, 1,300 apartments going up. And with the college, which would probably bring thousands of people to the college on a daily basis, whether it's during the day or mostly at night, you would think there would be a tremendous demand. The neighborhood, when we went through the community board, the community board said to us, you know, we don't want another McDonald's, right? Bring us a real restaurant. They want an Applebee's. They want something that is a, a national chain where you can sit down and eat, not just take, you know. Right, and, and you know, that's interesting because the related project, the Gateway at the Bronx Terminal Market, in their, in their advertisement, shows that they have an Applebee's. And the Applebee's is going to be on the, on the ground floor level. So besides taking care of the people just go to the center, it's going to be able to take care of the people in the community. Right. Uh, and you know, the, you take in Times Square the Red Lobster, which does the highest grossing volume in the country, because there there is a need. And as you say, they don't want the Applebee's. But you're also you, you've been innovative in the Bronx in another aspect. You created these uh, three family homes. These. Uh, well, we, we've been lucky enough to build over 500 three-family homes in the last seven years in the Bronx. And uh, those people who bought these homes from us, let's say, four or five years ago, have seen the appreciation during the good part of the real estate market to two or $300,000 in, um, in their house. Currently, uh, our three-family homes go for about six hundred to $650,000 in the Bronx. But with the new problems in the uh, mortgage market, um, uh, it's, it's difficult unless you have sufficient equity to put down of at least 15%. It's difficult to uh, buy them for many of the people uh, in the I Bronx. I don't want to get out to the subprime, but would you say many of your original purchases over the years may have put down like three to five percent? I would say in the beginning, three or four years ago, most of the people put down at least 10 percent. I would say now, in the last few years, most of the people put down no more than five percent. The mortgages were plenty out there. You didn't have to put down as much. And in a three-family home, if you're living in one apartment and you're renting out two, it was almost paying by itself and if you had some depreciation. But now that things have changed radically in the mortgage market, you cannot buy a three-family house with 5% down. You have to put at least 10 to 15% down. And that's a lot of money. That's 10% uh, is 60000 20% is 120000 Which is difficult for the, the person who's going to buy that, that house in the Bronx. Right. You know, we, we were talking prior to the show, and I'd like you to explain, both of you to explain to, to my audience, with regard to the lottery and how somebody wins the lottery and then they have like a permanency that they can stay there for life even though their income may be greater. What happens? Um, and and you were I, also saying that for your one property, for 46 units, you had 7,000 people apply for the lottery. We had a middle, in middle income project that just came online. We had for almost 40 units, we had 7,000 applications. It's incredible. Yeah, just to get back to the point about the Applebee's. Which you talk, I think that what happens with the national chain stuff, they underestimate the sophistication of the Bronx market. And I think that is where the, the cardinal sin is right now. There's no reason why there shouldn't be an Applebee's or a Barnes & Noble slash Starbucks store. Uh, the people are there. The dollars are there. Um, and it's, I think we're getting closer. And with his company right. doing that, I, I just think it's, unfortunately, we talked about the bonfire of the vanities and that image. And that still resonates more Absolutely than but, the but, yeah, image but, nationally. But, but you unfortunately, know, Tom Wolfe, you know, his book sold a lot and made it into a movie. But the bottom line is that that image still resonates with a lot of the national chains. I know that my partner attended a shopping center convention last year. And um, 
I think what you guys are doing really could maybe spearhead it with people but understand. That's an education but, but, that, but that's the urban initiative that you guys have done. Right. I mean, you've made a commitment to this urban market. Right. I mean, uh, we're only talking about the Bronx, but you have a commitment. You have in Brooklyn, you have downtown Brooklyn, you have Canarsie, right. you have Sheepshead Bay, right. uh, you have in in you have upper in Inwood. You, so you've really right. committed to to sure. take care of the urban neighborhoods because they're. Retail, New York City is under retail. It's it totally under retail. But what would hurt to have, you know, uh, an H and M, which is a low price mm -hmm. clothing, w w which is a great example because when H and M opened up on 125th Street, you can't get in. Right. What would hurt if to have a, a smaller Marshalls or a, the, or a Nike you, or a Nike? Nike? And you know they are doing prototype now. Uh, I spoke to Jeff Winnick the other day. They're coming out with a 4,000 square foot Dwayne Reed. Which could handle, you know, to go to your center or your site, four thousand square feet, and also have part of the food needs because they don't carry as much as a Walgreens, right. but they can provide that. Well, in Fordham, it, which is the number one commercial area in the Bronx, uh, 149th Street, number two, and Southern Boulevard, number three, you do have these major tenants. But at Fordham, they're paying seventy, eighty, ninety, up to a hundred dollars, or maybe sometimes even more. In the other areas that that we build in, uh, that Mark and and we build, um, you're not going to find. You can't get those rents, so you can't expect to get those type of tenants. Now, on on Southern, you have a Conway's, which is not as high as an H and M, but it's a big, uh, you know, it's a bigger department store. But it would be a wonderful idea because why should there? You've got people coming in, mid-income people coming into the Bronx. The Bronx. The the the, uh, poli the politicians in the Bronx, community boards, they want affordability, but they also want mid-income. They want home ownership, condominiums and co-ops. It's very important, and it's it's going to serve the Bronx. I mean, you know, look at Old Navy. Old Navy is the low low of the gap. You know, the gap has all these varieties. When you open up an Old Navy in certain neighborhoods, like the Old Navy in Harlem, the Old Navy in Flushing, they do great. They do yeah. great. It is an education process. The retailers that understand it, they understand the density, and they come to terms with you know the fact that it's not a typical suburban location, but they shouldn't be afraid of the diversity or what they call it's an ethnic neighborhood. Um, those retailers that get it, uh, we have relationships with them, it, it works fine, and they've been very successful um, going into the urban areas. I think there's still a fair and, and number. And what about the Starbucks? I mean, you, Starbucks. you have Starbucks on every corner in the city, yes. in Brooklyn, everywhere else. I don't Starbucks see too many Starbucks in the Bronx. I don't see them either. I think it's a matter of the right location for them, because Starbucks is a retailer who does get it. It's really a function of getting the right location, because they're very particular about where they'll go, the going to work side, and you know the, whether or not they've got enough access, enough visibility. So there, I think it's a function of getting and the right location. What about the banks? You know, you, you'd mentioned before you tried to get a bank yes. over there. What would hurt? And and banks get certain incentives. I know uh, Carter, Carver Bank, did it in certain parts of Brooklyn. What would hurt Carver? Uh, or you know the for the, the credits that they get for a, a Chase to open up a small little branch over there. Well, you have those banks all over the Bronx. Chase is very big in, in the Bronx. You find uh, what, them. Are they Ponce in? Leon Federal Savings Bank very big in the Bronx? You know, uh, you'll find a bank will t I think will take a chance quicker than some of the big uh, big named uh, tenants because everybody has to bank. No matter, you've, you've got to have a checking account. You have to have to ATM machines. If we could bring in to the outer lying Bronx, not necessarily in Fordham and 149th Street, but where where Atlantic and Jackson build buildings, affordable buildings, if we could bring in a little more solid tenants, this would be a major why, move for the Bronx. Why couldn't Bank of America, who opens up, I have seen a number of the kiosks that they open, why couldn't they rent an 80 square feet kiosk in your thing? or? With a college in a village, I think that's probably work at the college. I mean, I'm thinking models. I'm thinking, why can't we get? I mean, there's such a, you know, athletic dynam dynamic in these communities, and you wonder, there's is there a models in uh, the Bronx? If, if it is, it's probably you in, know, near there's the one area. place that's on uh, you know on uh, East Tremont, Frank's Athletic Store. Right? It's been there for years. <laughs> well, and you ever walk you know, in there? It's I think it's the only be, place. You know, I, I they're used to paying bigger bucks for stores. If they came to the Commercial areas that we're building, we wouldn't. We would. We don't need seventy, sixty dollars a square foot. We're good at thirty, thirty-five dollars a square foot. They would do wonderful. Trust me. Applebee's, 
whether it was at Boricua or where we are, where we are, you have thousands, literally thousands of families living in a five to ten block area. They'll die to eat at, at Applebee's. Applebee's should step up and come to the Bronx in these areas. I think, as I said to you when we were talking earlier, it's really a perception issue too. I think when you do um, either subsidized or lower income housing, I think there's a feeling that. One, you're going to have security but, but, issues, but, but and let's, two, let's, you're not going to have enough disposable income. But let's income. be realistic. The, the building at Atlantic, uh, Jackson, uh, you know, and the other developers, of the maybe of the 20,000 units that have come on board over the last 10 years, all of this has been affordable or, you know, or semi-market rate. Right. With the exception of Riverdale, which people don't realize is the Bronx, you haven't seen any luxury housing. And Riverdale, in reality, the buildings that have been built there, the new buildings, have been failures because they weren't marketed correctly. You know, there was a perception that they could get a certain type of tenant, and those tenants really didn't, those people didn't want to move in. Sure. But Neil had, uh, has done, he said, 500 home ownership units. So, and the community but boards, as Neil said, they, home they, they don't right. want, the community boards don't want our tax credit 60% area median housing. When you go to the community board, they want something else. They want to know that the children who grew up and maybe first generation have gone to colleges stay in the Bronx. And how do they stay in the Bronx when there's a building like we built in Northern Bronx, Orloff Avenue, that has, has a gym inside the building, that has top-end top the... laundry, you know. And um, it's mostly perception because the bodies are there, that people want to stay in the Bronx. It's safer than ever. I mean, Adolfo Carrion has done a great job continuing the work of Freddie Ferrer. Uh, so it's getting through that first one, you know, if an H&M did one, then I think everybody would follow. Right. So. I agree. Right. I agree. We find that in the three-family houses that uh, we have built, the owner rents out two of the units, and the going rate now for a three-family on a rental in one of these houses is between fourteen and sixteen hundred dollars a month. And how big of a unit do they it's have? About a thousand, thousand fifty square feet. I mean, feet. three bedroom. Three bedroom, three bedroom, two bath. Now. That is a good rent. There, you know, if that people, means those people are making a hundred grand, I mean, right. they're making a hundred grand that house. If they can pay that, we don't only have to build affordable; we can also build mid-income. The difference between a mid-income rent and an affordable rent may be on a two-bedroom, three hundred dollars a month. There is a demand for this in the Bronx, and following those mid-income comes a demand for a, a better class of store in the Bronx. We have bodegas on every corner. That has to change, and if it changes. The Bronx will continue to change upward. You know, 30 minutes have gone by, and I got to do another show in the Bronx, and we'll do it in a couple weeks probably, but I really like to thank. Uh, I don't want to sit next to you next show. I'd <laughs> sit there okay. and look at you straight. Okay. okay I'd like to thank Mark. Only caveat. Okay. <laughs> my, my, my younger brother, Mark Altheim, who I consider my brother, uh, principal of Atlantic Development, uh, Numa Jerome. Uh, Senior Vice President, Director of Leasing at Arcadia Realty Trust, and Neil, the Grand Poopa Weissman uh, of uh, Jackson Development. Next week, we leave the Bronx and we talk about what's happening in Brooklyn. See you next week. Major funding for these programs is provided by grants from HSH Nordbank and First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, Allied Partners, Bank of America, Murray Hill Properties, SJP Properties, Greenberg Traurig LLP. Additional funding is provided by grants from Antares Investment Partners, Arbor Realty Trust, Athena Group, BRT Realty Trust, Burden LLP, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Habitats, City Investment Fund, Cushman and Wakefield, Eastern Consolidated, Essex Capital Partners, Helmsley Spear, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Jackson Development Group, Meridian Capital Group, McSam Hotel Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Moynian Organization, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal & Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sidney Fetner Associates, Stonehenge Partners, 
Studley, Sutfin Properties, the Wickhoff Organization, Extreme Construction and Deconstruction.